Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 241st episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Bill Backrack. Bill is the chairman and CEO of Advisor Roadmap, which provides training and mentorship to help financial advisors better attract and communicate with their ideal clients. What's unique about Bill, though, is that as the creator of the value-based financial planning framework and father of the now famous question, what's important about money to you? Bill pioneered a repeatable process to put client values and goals at the center of the financial planning conversation at a time when the industry was still focused almost exclusively on product sales. In this episode, we talk in depth about how Bill's what's important about money to you question not only gives advisors a powerful way to start a meaningful conversation, but to also give prospects an opportunity to communicate the value that they're seeking from a financial planning relationship. How that opening question is just part of Bill's script for having values conversations with prospects to create a foundation of trust and ultimately helps advisors, as Bill puts it, to rescue prospects from their current advisors. And how Bill uses his values roadmap as a deliverable to visually show prospects the steps that they can take to fulfill their most deeply held values and achieve their most important goals. We also talked about Bill's five prospect conversations, each of which occurred during the first prospect meeting, including the opening, values, goals conversations, as well as what Bill calls all the money and commitment to higher steps. Bill's techniques and suggestions for leading those conversations without overly controlling the conversation, and how recording prospect conversations for later review not only helps advisors build even more trust and relevance, but also ends up helping advisors learn to listen more, say less, ask better questions, and answer prospect questions more effectively. And be certain to listen to the end, where Bill shares his recommendations for helping prospects more concretely identify and define their goals, with not just the name, target, date, and cost, but also the emotionally compelling words that describe what achieving the goal would feel like to include on their financial roadmap. Why Bill feels that it's an advisor's obligation to take full advantage of the financial planning tools available to them and why doing so makes it even easier to rescue clients away from advisors who don't. And Bill's view that trust isn't a function of an advisor's technical chops, but is instead a function of character, the ability to ask good questions, listen, and ultimately hold clients accountable to the advice that they're given. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Bill Backrack. Welcome, Bill Backrack, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Well, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you. I appreciate all the great work you do for financial advisors, and I feel privileged to have an opportunity to chat with you today. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, I really appreciate that. I I, I really feel honored that you're willing to come out and and join us. You know, I I, I started in the business a little over twenty years ago, and and remember very early on being given one of one of your books, value-based selling. You know, you later did value-based financial planning, but this was even still in the values-based selling days. And you know, got got introduced to some of your work in this, you know, this question that you put out there that I, I think you're you're now pretty well known for of of you know asking clients what's important about money to you. And and I'll admit, like I, you know, I started out in the insurance side of the industry, you know, selling variable universal life at the peak of the tech boom, because that's what we did in the industry back then. And I'll, like, I will fully own and admit, I, I didn't get it. When I first read it, I'm like, I, all right, I thought I'm supposed to like, you know, I'm like, I'm gathering data from the client, I need to know about like their income and their financial situation, because I'm trying to figure out if variable universal life is appropriate sale for them. And if so, how to position it to, uh, uh, to get them to, you know, buy our company's product and why our company's products is better than other big companies' products. I'm like, why would I ask them what's important about money to you? Like, it just, I didn't really get how it fit into my sales process. And, and I think that's in part because I don't know that it really entirely does fit into a sales process, right? It, it, it fits into an advice process. It fits into a financial planning process. And, and, you know, as the whole industry, I think is evolving from sales to advice, you know, not, not only does it just change the value proposition and the business model of what we do, but it, but it really changes at a very fundamental level. Like 
the client conversations we have, how we how we connect with clients, how we get clients, and just the whole nature, I think, of you know, what it means to sell a product, which is all about like, you know, the features and benefits of the product my company makes available to you through me, versus what happens when we actually have to sell advice and financial planning. Like my value is me and my knowledge and the information that I've got between my two ears and the way that I can deliver that to you to give you recommendations to, that get to your goals. And I feel like you were very prescient in seeing this coming long before I ever got it when I showed up in the industry of you know how different your conversations have to be when you go from the, the product business into the advice business. That's a great story, Michael. And I, I wouldn't be so hard on yourself about not getting it because that's really, I, I think, how we all started. You know, we all started either on the investment sales side or on the insurance sales side. And to your point, we were really focused on some particular kind of product. I happened to start on the investment side. And then hopefully, I think the the best of us, we have this epiphany at some point that, yeah, just selling investments or selling insurance, that's that's good, that's valuable, but there's something bigger than that. And so I would say I created values-based financial planning and the crux of it is that what's important about money to you, it's the question that starts it, but more importantly, it's the conversation that follows it. I, I created that not as a technique for financial advisors to get clients. It was created to help people recognize the value of planning and to inspire them to either engage in planning in the first place or to significantly improve their planning to increase the probability that they would achieve their most important goals and fulfill their most deeply held values. And so the crux of that is the values conversation. And then, of course, the, the byproduct of that, these intimate conversations, because everybody has embedded in their subconscious minds an imaginary trust dial, the byproduct is that everything that's said and done between a client and advisors moves the needle on the trust dial one direction or the other. So a byproduct of the values conversation is a high level of trust. And we all know that trust is the most important element. And ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to inspire someone and give them a reason to hire you as their financial advisor and effectively fire their current advisor. And so values-based financial planning is the blending of the most important or effective fundamentals of personal and professional development with financial planning. And ironically, to this day, you know, long after I had invented values-based financial planning and proved that it worked for me, and now it's worked for thousands of other financial advisors, is it even today, most advisors still seem to be product-centered. They do sort of light financial planning as a means to their ends, which is to gather assets and sell insurance. So if you do something bigger than that, what I call real financial planning, and I know you're supportive of that as well, you can actually steal, or as I like to say, rescue clients from those unenlightened advisors who are still focused on gathering assets and selling insurance. I call that that segment the, the financial advisors, right? Just the people who are actually in the business of advice, because unfortunately the the term financial advisor has kind of kind of been stolen or distorted into the product industry to the point that right there was a point a few decades ago where you know stockbrokers were actually called stockbrokers insurance agents were called insurance agents and and investment advisors who manage money had their own titles but we've sort of thrown everyone into one giant pot of just calling them financial advisors regardless of whether their business or their training or their experience actually has anything to do with advising on anything and so yeah we we've We've taken a sort of cr creating the new term and calling them financial advisors to talk about the just the people that are really in the business of advice. Their value proposition is advice. What they're paid for at the end of the day is the advice. And and as you've noted, like it 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 shows up differently. It relates differently. It connects differently. You know, to the point that I I, I feel like we needed a different label just to distinguish them from the rest. And the opportunity is clients are slowly and steadily going from advisors to advisors. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate the tag that you've put on that because I think that does distinguish it. You know, the good news is, is that clients have always been willing to make that shift 
based on the experience that they have in interacting with that that person who is truly giving financial advice and is doing something bigger and better than what most sort of generic financial advisors do. You know, the term wealth manager is another one of those ambiguous sort of means nothing terms. There's no consistency. And I think to your point, there's no consistency to any of this. There's no way to really tell by someone's title what they actually do. You know, and unfortunately, if your financial advisor title catches on and I like it, you know, there'll be some group of people who try and bastardize that too and pretend that they do something more than they really do. Marketplaces are are competitive and constantly evolving. It's what makes the whole system so fascinating. I am really struck though, the so the comment you made at the beginning of of sort of what where did the what's important about money to you question come from that as you kind of cited like the question starts it the conversation that follows it is really valuable and and it i think as you put it it helps people recognize the value of financial planning which to me is just there's something really profound in that when when so many of us today are in this world where i feel like what i do is valuable i know it's valuable i've got these clients who pay me very well and I have wonderfully high retention rates. Like I know I'm doing good things, but we, so many of us seem to struggle to figure out how to describe what the value of financial planning is for, you know, the next prospect that we're sitting across from. And I, I think there's something really powerful in how you frame it that, you know, if you start out with a question, like what's important about money to you, what, what your clients, or I guess at that point, your prospects answer, they are going to describe what is what the value of financial planning is for them, right? If someone says what's important about money to you is is about security and peace of mind, it's like, well, great news, I'm in the peace of mind business. If someone says, you know, what's important about money to me is a pathway to free up more of my time to spend it with my kids and family and the things that are important to me, it's like, well, great news, I'm in the business of freeing up your time so you can spend more time with your family. I think there's something striking. We we try so hard to figure out how to supplant what the value of financial planning is for the client. And you know, that question of yours and that framework just at the most fundamental level shifts the value conversation of, well, you know, the value of financial planning can actually show up for a, in a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. If you really want to know what the value of your financial planning is, ask clients what's important about money to them and then just shut up and let them answer <laughs> and they'll tell you exactly what the value of financial planning is. Yeah, that's a great way to describe that. So you build trust by listening to their story, not by telling yours. So I find it sort of almost entertaining, certainly ironic, at how much effort financial professionals put into trying to describe what they do and then being frustrated when their so-called elevator pitch doesn't accomplish the outcome. And the, the whole premise is wrong. The premise is that uh, the attempted premise is if I am better at describing what I do, people will respond when the premise is actually the effective premise is you shouldn't be just trying to describe what you do at all from the very beginning of meeting someone anytime, any place, anywhere is to, they should be talking. You build trust by listening to their story, not by telling yours whether that's in the prospecting phase, whether that's in the face-to-face meeting phase, whether that's someone being a client, because if you will ask good questions and really listen, then you're right. It's actually a principle from adult learning theory called creating relevance. And so you can't really describe financial planning. In fact, if I were to, I'll make a statement and I'll encourage your listeners to never say this again. People don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. All right. So those kind of, you know, ridiculous platitudes and cliches. Well, I, mean, I think accurate. I might have actually used that at some point. All right. So why, why am I not supposed to say that? It's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll own it. Well, you might've done it in the past as I did, but it's because it, it uses negative emotions, right? So you build trust by listening to their story. You build trust by inspiring people with positive emotions. So we were also taught to sell using fear and greed. Well, trusted advisors don't resort to those kinds of things because you don't have to. So when you understand what's important to people and you described it very, very well, you inspire them to want to either do planning in the first place or elevate the level of their planning for their personal emotional payoff. 
And so when you have something, you know, better than a cliche, which would be their personal motivation for doing something, uh, Roy Disney, Walt's brother and the former Disney CEO said, when your values are clear, your decisions are easy. So it, uh, circling back to that adult learning theory, adults need to understand the relevance. They need to understand, so what's the outcome for me of doing this? And the more personal you make that, the more compelling it is. So there's no more compelling relevance than that by doing planning, it will help me fulfill my most deeply held values and achieve my most important goals. So it's values first, because that's the emotional why or the emotional payoff. Then it's the goals, and the goals are the tangible what they want. And when you combine the power of that, and we actually do this in a visual document, it's a 17 by 22 inch piece of paper, you may remember, called the financial roadmap. And so both spouses' values are on the financial roadmap. And it's not just that their words are there. It's that each spouse got to listen to the other talk about what's important to them from their most basic survival values to their desire to help others and make a difference in their world to their most personal self-actualizing core values. And what I found so shocking as a, a young advisor who has, I mean, when I was creating this you know, the things that exist today, you know, the scripts and the explanations and what questions to ask and how to follow up and how to tie it all together and how to put your offer on the table and how to answer the questions using their personal values and their goals. You know, I was experimenting with all this. I was just studying financial services and financial planning and personal and professional development. And the values conversation came out of personal development. And I remember sitting in this sort of psychological funky class, the communication skills class thinking, how would I ever incorporate a values exercise into an initial meeting with a prospect who may become a client? How do I help all these people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s? I was 20 years old at the time. And I, and I know their financial advisors suck. I mean, I know they're working with a stockbroker. I know they're not really getting this. How do I help them recognize and discover that there's something bigger out there without just sounding like a 26-year-old talking about the features and benefits of financial planning, saying things like, people don't fail to plan, they plan to fail. I didn't find that very compelling you know, for millionaires in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, which is who I wanted as clients. And so putting all that all into perspective inspires people to say, yeah, I want that. And they want it before they really understand what it is. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm circling. The, to me, this helps in setting context as to, well, I both in retrospect, like kind of the, the name values-based financial applying that you put forth, but it's sort of the, the sequence to it of, you know, the values are the why, the goals are the what. And that, you know, to, I guess to use the Simon Sinek thing, like you have to start with the why part first, which is just striking to me because we are, I think, particularly in today's environment, so focused on goals, right? Goals based financial planning, goals based investing, goals based planning software. Like, you know, everything is goals, 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 goals. And, yeah, like you're you're essentially making the 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 case of like no, you actually shouldn't start with goals. Not that you're not going to get there, but that's actually not where you start because they may not even be clear on their goals yet. You actually have to get the values part first, of which what's important about money to you is going to very quickly start getting to someone's va uh, values around money. Right? That's that's not what's important about money to you is not a goals conversation question. That's a values question. Correct. And, you know, it's always been this way. I mean, this is just how human beings are are wired. And so, and you would never want to ask somebody a why question. So in conversation, I'm happy to say that values are the emotional why and goals are the tangible what, right? But when you're actually talking to someone, you would never ask them a why question because why questions tend to make people feel defensive. Right. So why are you doing this or why are you doing that? Or why did you make this choice? So I don't know if it goes back to our childhood when, you know, our parents were kind of always questioning our behavior and our choices using the why word. Yeah. Like in, in practice, asking, yeah, I'm thinking in the parenting context, like asking why questions is usually because I am trying to make you second guess your prior behaviors. <laughs> like I'm asking you to think through why you should have not done what you did. That's why I ask a why question as a parent. 
Exactly. And so the what's important about money to you gets to that without framing it in a way that would create someone, again, someone creating a negative emotion versus a positive emotion. So to sort of wrap this up or, or put a pin on this, perhaps happy to answer a follow-up question, values first. Values are kind of like the vision. Right. So the vision of what's important to you. And then ironically, what I found as a 26, 27, 28 year old financial advisor when I started and I was creating and perfecting this and using it, it was stunning to me how many people in their 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s would literally look across the table at each other. People who've been married for decades. Right. And we would look across the table at Bob and we're eight minutes into the meeting. I mean, this is literally the first thing you do. It's the very beginning of the meeting. And so you introduce the question, and I'm happy to explain how you do that. But just to make this point, they Sue would look at Bob and go, boy, we, we've just never really talked about these things. And I remember, you know, as a 26, 27-year-old single guy, I just always assumed, you know, if you've been married for 20 or 30 years, you know, you talked about it. So I wasn't expecting it to be a new conversation. I was just expecting it to be a way that they would put that, you know, they'd articulate it and they'd put it into words. And it isn't that they didn't know what was important to each other. It's that they'd never really heard their spouse say it in exactly this way, using this word. And now here it is on a big piece of paper in front of them. We call it a value staircase. And there is Sue's value stack, 10 or 15 answers or words. And there's Bob's value stack and it's just right in front of them. And then the other beautiful thing, Michael, that they would say is, you know, boy, in all the years we've been working with John over at XYZ competitive firm to mine, we've never had these kind of conversations. And so ironically, I found the longer they had their advisor, the relationship with their existing advisor, the easier they were to steal. Because here I am in the first 10, 15, 20 minutes, and, they, and it's funny, they would also say things to me like, I don't know why we're telling you all this. And I remember sort of sitting there thinking, because I just asked you the question. <laughs> but in, in their mind, they're like sort of you know, spilling their guts in the first 15 or 20 minutes, and they've never actually done that with anybody before. And the real answer to the question is, because shockingly, people don't ask each other what's important. People don't ask each other what's important. They don't really listen. You know, it's a classic, you know, listening mistake, right? We're not really listening to understand and hear. We're just listening. So waiting for our turn to speak. We're actually formulating what we're going to say. We're not really listening to the other person speak. And so these are just fundamentals of building trust, uh, fundamentals of inspiring people to want financial planning and then to implement the planning because now this becomes the reasons to implement. So every time you give someone advice, you connect it to the reason we want you to allocate your assets this way. The reason we want you to get your uh, your taxes more effective or more efficient, the reason to get your legal documents done, the reason to uh, make these changes to all these various types of insurance, the reason to have cash reserves, the reason to pay off your debt, the reasons always become because it's connected to your goals and your values. So values first, emotional payoff first, tangible goals second, much easier for people to define their specific goals after a values conversation than before. So circling back to your point, values first, goals second. So then help me understand how, just how you do set this conversation up in practice. If I'm, you know, I'm sitting down with a new, with a new prospect. I mean, I, I you know, maybe this is in, in my own head, but I feel like literally like, you know, sitting across from Mr. and Mrs. Jones, like, I'm, I'm so glad you came in to join us today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. But, you know, to get started, I, I'd love to just know, like, what's important about money to you? I mean, like, do I, am I just like starting right there? Like, let's, let's go game on. Yeah, that, that's actually pretty good. The first thing is you have to have a process. And so I just, I think the, the real, well, one of the key lessons here is, do you have a scripted, repeatable process for conducting a meeting with a prospect where the probable or potential outcome of that meeting is you're going to invite them to become a client and then there's some possibility or probability that they're going to say yes. 
So that should be a scripted, repeatable process. It should also be visual. It should be experiential. It should be engaging. And so I'm, I'm happy to, and, and you'll see, I can very easy drop into what the script is to start the meeting. The, the first lesson though is there is a scripted, repeatable process. And most financial advisors don't have that. Most financial, if I say, well, show me your, show me your flow chart for how you take someone through the pipeline of a prospect to becoming a client. And then what you do for them, it's usually sort of deer in the headlights. There is no flow chart. And then if there were a flow chart behind every geometric shape on the flow chart, there is a script. There are talking points. There's a script of exactly what to do. And of course, you can't have scripted out what the other person is going to say, but you certainly would know your questions in the sequence that they're going to be asked. You know, you're a good example of that. You're an expert at interviewing people, Michael. And so you have a game plan of what questions you're going to ask today. So you don't know what my answers are going to be, but you know what questions you're going to ask. And then you can do a little adapting and responding with follow-up questions to my answer. So that's the first point that I would make about having every advisor, there should be consistency of what you do to take your prospects through an exercise that culminates in them wanting to be a client or not. I know we're going to get we're going to get a little bit more into the scripting in a moment because I actually do want to hear how this how this plays out. But like I'm just you know I'm channeling what I I know is going to be the response for a lot of people listening, and I'm sure you've heard many times as well. Like, but Bill, if you do it scripted, like it's cans. No one likes canned presentations. Like you know we all get angry when we're calling into customer service and you can tell the person's on the script and you're like, for Christ's sake, would you stop being stuck on the script and just answer and solve my problem? Arguably that's probably scripting done poorly and there are better ways to do it. But just, I feel like a lot of people have a gut response of negativity around the idea of scripting conversations. And so how do you think about scripting in a in a more positive way well first of all let's just that's just such a bunch of bull you know this whole idea that you know oh i have this bad reaction to scripting I, i'm laughing as you're saying it because what it really is is it's i don't want to do the work to memorize and internal internalize the script to the degree that i don't suck at it so it's sort of a ridiculous idea that somehow well i'm better off what's the alternative my meetings are more effective if i wing them then if, because all scripting is, is I've planned what I'm going to do. I'm prepared to do it and I'm good at it. I'm so good at it that it co- doesn't come across as canned. It doesn't come across as stilted. That would be like saying to a professional athlete, you shouldn't have a playbook. You should have no, pl- no plays scripted out and you should have no plan to go out and execute the plays in the playbook. But it just, I think it, we can probably talk about this even more. I think it really explains why so many financial advisors are sort of stuck in the mediocre middle. And I think we could agree that most financial advisors, they're at best average communicators, they're at best average financial professionals, you know, they're not advisors as you've described. And it's largely this sort of crap that they create in this mind, their mind, which is just a justification for not doing the work. Because what it comes down to is when you actually practice it at the level that that should be done if you're doing it right. You have you are not just reading a script or even memorizing a script. You have internalized the script to the point that it's going to come out as natural conversation. And I guess in the same way, I'm imagining the you know the the performer on stage. Like you don't go to a Broadway play and think, well, that would have been so much better if they had just been winging it instead of doing the script. Right? They instead they learn the script so well that it sounds genuinely like a like a natural conversation they're really having on the stage even though 100% of the thing is scripted. And, and not everybody can, can do that. You know, so, and it's certainly at a Broadway level, but we could all do it. I mean, again, the, the beauty today is there are already existing scripted, repeatable processes that are proven to work. In fact, I did not want to create one. It was not my goal to create values-based financial planning. My goal was to be the poster child implementer of my company's methodology. And I worked for Merrill Lynch and I was just enormously disturbed when I asked for the playbook and they didn't have one. They had a phone phone book in a cubicle, (laughs) just 1990s. So, I mean, I want to meet, 
high net worth, like millionaires. I deliberately went to work. I have no background in financial services. I don't come from a wealthy family. I didn't finish college. So I, and when I was in college, I didn't study finance and economics and accounting. And there was no personal financial planning curriculum when I was in college. And so I, I like, well, you're going to teach me. And the reason I went to work for a big brand name like Merrill Lynch is I assumed they were going to teach me how to meet high net worth people in La Jolla, how to have conversations with them, how to schedule appointments with them, how to run those meetings, how to answer the key questions that people would naturally ask, how much does it cost and what do we get? And then how to take care of those people who hired you. And none of that was in a scripted, repeatable process or a playbook. And so really, I'm sort of the accidental, successful financial advisor and financial advisor trainer, because I would have been very happy to be the poster child of memorizing and implementing a proven playbook had one existed. And unfortunately, I know that that's the case for most people in this industry. They I imagine a lot of people are nodding their heads going, yeah, I work for one of those companies now. And yeah, they don't have a proven scripted, repeatable process. Otherwise, candidly, Michael, if you think about it, I shouldn't exist, right? I mean, there should be no Bill Backrack who ever invented values-based financial planning. There shouldn't be tens of thousands of financial advisors who, you know, who sign up for our various training and follow our scripted, repeatable process and playbook. I mean, I, sh- I shouldn't exist. So, so help us follow a little more. Like, what what does this script look like? I, I obviously we don't have to do the entire financial planning prospect meeting, but maybe just to give us an example, I, how does this conversation kick off when we're trying to get to the like the opening of this conversation? I'm happy to do that. I'll, I will deliver that verbatim, and then you can tell me if it sounds like a bunch of scripted crap that nobody would listen to. <laughs> and, and then, but before that, there are essentially five conversations. And notice I call them conversations, right? So they're not presentations. The other thing that you'll notice is let's talk about what isn't there. There is no monologue from the advisor about their background, their credentials, how long they've been in the business, their designations, their qualifications, how great their company is. And I'll circle back. You build trust by listening to their story, not by telling yours. And so if you look at those companies who do have some scripts, and I've helped a lot of companies rewrite those things, is the first thing is I had one where I was hired by a major firm to help recreate their methodology. And I was on the flight out to do a particular training and begin that project. I was reading their manual and it actually opened by saying, so one of the things we want to make sure today to do today, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, is we were going to ask you a lot of questions because we need to learn a lot about you. And before we do that, you probably want to know all about us. And then I, I, I read it. No, way- no, actually they don't. Yeah, exactly. They don't. But I read it at a pace that I thought it would take someone to speak it. And it was almost 20 minutes. I mean, it was almost 20 minutes. I'm sitting on the airplane, turning the pages and I'm reading, you know, I'm sort of whispering it to myself at what I thought would be a conversational speed. And it was almost 20 minutes. And then after that, it said, so now that you know all about us, let me ask you some questions about you. And now talk about trying to memorize something. How'd you like to memorize a 20 minute monologue? So I say it's the five conversations. So there's the opening, which I'll demonstrate in a moment to answer your question specifically. Then there's the values conversation. Then there's the goals conversation. And then there's what we call the all the money. It's really an exercise, not a conversation because you have both spouses present with all their financial documents. And I'm happy to explore that. Most financial advisors don't know how to get the meeting with both spouses and they struggle to get people to bring all their financial documents. It's actually not that hard to do, but we can circle back to that later if you want. And then uh, the last conversation is what we call commitment to hire. And that's inviting them to become a client. You'll notice we don't use any sales terminology. We don't talk about handling objections. We don't talk about closing. We don't talk about making features and benefits presentations. And that's not just a question of semantics. Trusted advisors have a different way of being and a different way of operating than salespeople do. So let me just pause there. I want to answer your question about exactly how you open. Do you have any questions or comments about that? I I think the first is that I want to clarify is so like these five 
conversations, the opening, the values, the goals, all the money, commitment to hire. This is, in theory, a, a sequence of five conversations I'm going to have in in one meeting, in the meeting. Just we're we're scoping a single meeting here, not like a multi multi meeting process or anything. These are the elements of what could be the in person or the virtual meeting, and I'm I'm happy to also maybe explore. Should this meeting be in person? Can it be done virtually? How does that work? What's the difference? But to answer your question, yes, these are the elements of this particular meeting. And I'll circle back. Every meeting that you have with a prospect or client, at the very least, should have you know talking points and a sequential agenda. What we're talking about is leadership. So who's actually leading? It's not control. Right. Don't confuse leadership with control. We're not trying to control people, but we are effectively leading them because if they're going to pay you 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or $50,000 a year to help them achieve their most important goals and fulfill their most deeply held values, that there's a leadership aspect of this as well. And I think that's a lot of the challenge is a lot of advisors. They're just not effective at leading the clients end up dictating what happens. So they walk in and say, I got a bunch of questions that I read in Money Magazine, and I'm going to ask you these questions. And the advisors with no process just go, okay. And then they end up following the questions that the, and it's no wonder they don't get hired. You know, who wants to just hire the question answer person? So again, I, I want to get to answering your question about exactly how you open. Um, any other questions or comments before we do that? No, no, I think I'm, I'm curious just to understand more of what this looks like in practice. Like what is this, how does this opening work? Yeah. Happy to do it. So you and Ellie have come in for the meeting. Let's assume it's an in-person meeting and you're, you've come together, you've brought your financial documents. We don't start by looking at your financial documents. And the first thing I do is I express some appreciation for the effort you two have put forth to be prepared for this meeting. So notice how I don't say thank you for coming in because thank you implies you've come in for me. So, hey, thank you for coming in. Well, what am I thanking you for? Thank you for giving me an opportunity to make money today. And so it's it's always about them. So there's a better way to communicate that. So Michael and Ellie, I, I really appreciate the fact that you two have come in today. I know that you've taken time out of your busy schedules. You put out some effort to put your financial documents together. And the fact that you're here and you've done that really tells me that you're serious about making smart choices about your money. Is is that true? Yeah, I, w- I, w- I would like to feel smart about my money. Yes. All right. And then I would, you know, I know Ellie's not here, but I'd say, and what about you, Ellie? And both of you would express something about that. Well, I just want you to know that we take it very seriously as well. We're going to ask you a lot of questions today. We're going to put things in perspective on this big visual tool called the Financial Roadmap. You'll also notice that I'm recording the meeting today. And the reason that we record is because we're very thorough. Do you know how you can watch a movie a second or third time and see things you didn't see the first time through? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously, this is a lot more important than just watching a movie. So should we decide to do business together, my team and I will review all of my notes and this recording. So when we come back together, our advice will be just right for you. Interesting. And so breaking in for a moment of, you know, break, breaking the third wall. So, so you would, you would encourage advisors to like to record meetings that should be a part of what we're, what we're doing. Obviously, you just set it up to get permission from the client to do so. Well, technically, I didn't ask permission. I just told them I'm going to do it. Now, they have an opportunity to to dissent or push back, but they never do. And that's another one of those sort of, you know, you you talked earlier about, well, gee, I didn't really get asking what's important about money to you. I mean, I've been training advisors for, I mean, professionally for 33 years. And I started teaching my friends in the business when I was still a financial advisor because they couldn't understand why I was so successful given my background and they wanted to know what I was doing. It And clients love the fact that you're recording. So if we want to unpack that for a minute, the 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 next thing I should say is virtually everything that we're talking about here is about putting the client first. So the reason we ask the client questions is because it's better for them. The reason that we insist that both spouses are present for the meeting, even though sometimes they say, well, I take care of the money and my husband or wife doesn't need to be involved, we still insist that both spouses are present because this is a meeting about planning their future. 
this isn't a meeting about sort of technical economic things. So it's better for them that they're present. It's better for them if they get their financial documents together and bring them in. It's better for them if we put it in perspective on a visual tool called the financial roadmap. It's better for them if we have a permanent record of our conversation, because it's true. When I listen to the recording, I will pick up things that for whatever reason, I just didn't remember. I I can't remember every single thing that they said. And I, even if I take good notes, I may or may not have it captured in my notes. And then of course, the other people on my team who'll be involved in developing the plan and the advice, they weren't in the meeting. So now they have the benefit of actually hearing in the client's own words. So the reason for recording is to do a better job for the clients. And remember, we talked earlier about the imaginary trust dial. Everybody has embedded in their subconscious an imaginary trust dial. And everything you say and do moves the needle on the trust dial one direction or the other. And so this opening that I just did, just candidly telling them how this meeting was going to go, take a lot of notes, ask a lot of questions, put it in visual perspective and record, moves the needle on the trust dial in the right direction. Because I can assure you what's going through their mind is, you know, we've been working with Bob over at XYZ Company or Susan at ABC Company. And boy, that makes a lot of sense that you're recording the conversations to do a better job for us. And no other advisor we've ever worked with has done that. So I don't have to say I'm a better advisor. You can't say I'm a better advisor because I have these credentials or because I have this experience. You demonstrate that you're a better advisor by what you do, not by what you say. So yes, you record every client meeting, every prospect meeting. Yes, you listen to them. And then the other byproduct of listening to the recordings is you become a much better communicator. So you're not only doing a better job for the client, but you will be horrified at what you hear when you listen to these recordings, which is how you'll become a better communicator. You'll learn how to say less and listen more. You'll learn how to ask better questions. You'll learn how when it is your turn to speak, you'll become more effective at answering the questions people ask and putting your ideas on the table. I mean, every person who's an expert in communication, one of the fundamental things that they do is they record and they review the recordings. Any other questions about that? I just wondering, I like recommendation literally for how you do the recording. Like, is this audio? Do you go so far as like video? I mean, are we setting up, are we setting up cameras? Like, how do you tell advisors to implement this? Well, the simplest thing to do, and and I appreciate, and again, it's one of those things. I've never had an advisor who said it wouldn't be helpful to listen to a recording of a conversation with a prospect or a client. I mean, nobody's ever said, I think I'd do a worse job or I wouldn't do a better job if I could listen to that again. Right. I can imagine a few people that say, I'm not even sure I want to hear myself recorded, but, but, but arguably that's your point. Like, yeah, well, if you think it's so bad when you hear yourself, imagine what it's like for the prospect who who just had to sit through that meeting with you, like go listen and figure out how to do it better. And the fundamental issue there is you say, well, I don't want to record because I don't want to hear it. Well, you've just breached the fiduciary standard because you've put your desire to not be in pain ahead of something that would be beneficial for the client. And it's sort of, well, isn't that the ultimate putting the client first is you're always putting the client first and not just when it's comfortable for you, but you're always putting the client first, especially when it's uncomfortable for you. That's what it means to put their interest first. So I like to at least put this out there in a way that is, let's call it the the least painful. So let's keep it simple because if you think audio is painful, and I know you've done this because you do a lot of speaking at conferences, you know, I'm sure you have seen yourself on video and you are an excellent communicator, Michael. I mean, we've been on the same programs together. I just know that no matter how good of communicators we, we become, you watch those videos and you just go, oh my God. Oh, it's still cringy. Yeah. Like I, I, I look at how I did it 10, 15 years ago and it's cringy and I look at it now and I, I, I still cringe, right? We're just, we're, we're our own, we're our own harshest critics most of the time, which makes it hard to watch recordings yourself, but also can be very motivating and focusing for getting better. If you're willing to, you know, go, go to the tape and, and see how, how really could you have done that better? And and you really hit the a, a really important point. You have to do it so many times that you get over just the pain of watching yourself. You can really kind of disassociate 
hey, that that's me or that's you up there and really focus on, okay, this is what I did well, and this is what I intended to do. And here's where I deviated from that. Mm, This is where I let the client take me off track. If I had to do it over again, here's what I could have done. So we never went down that rabbit hole. Here's what I could have done to prevent us from going down that in the first place. Here's what I could have done to get us back on track more quickly. Mm, Well, here's why the meeting lasted an hour and 45 minutes when it really could have lasted 45 to 50 minutes. You become much more effective at that. So the more you do it, the more you get able to disconnect from the pain of some of the minor things that don't really matter. Uh, Like most people hate the sound of their own voice in the beginning. You know, so even if your voice is quite pleasant to listen to, you're just, your voice on recording sounds different than what you hear when you're speaking. Uh, So to get to your, uh, the specific answer to your question, you know, when I started, I just, I mean, those were, it was in the eighties. So we had cassette recorders, you know, so I started with just a cassette recorder and literally had hundreds, probably thousands of, you know, cassettes in the hard paper file folders of all my prospects and clients. But in today's world, you've got an app on your phone. I mean, your phone is a recorder. So you put your phone on do not disturb, you disconnect it from the Wi-Fi and turn all the notifications off and you literally just use use your phone. You know, if you ever watched one of our training videos of me demonstrating an entire financial roadmap, I just point at the phone and say, and we're recording today because we're really thorough and I'm just recording through the, um, I happen to use an iPhone and there are probably dozens of apps, but it comes with an app called voice memos and that works great. And then of course, what you have to do is then you transfer that. And of course I'm a Mac person, so I just airdrop it and it goes into the same encrypted folder where all of your private prospect or client documents would go. That's how you retain that. In the old days, we used to just put it in a locked filing cabinet, but in today's world, it's an MP3 or an uh, an MP3 or an MOV, or I'm sorry, an MP3 or a WAV file or one of those. And it's in the folder and you just listen to it from your phone. You can Bluetooth it through your car's media system. If you start to cry, you know, pull over. And I I guess ironically in the in the Zoom, in the Zoom world that many of us have found ourselves in over the past year, like it just gets even easier, right? Recordings built right in. Just gets even easier. You just and and they can see again, you're not doing this surreptitiously. You're not covertly recording. You're telling them that you're recording. And then very rarely do you even get a question about it, let alone pushback. What if somebody does say, well, I don't want you to record? You have to have the ability to say, well, the reason that we're recording is because we will do a better job for you should we decide to do business together. Well, what do you do with the recording if we decide not to do business together? I'm happy to destroy it. I mean, so again, you rarely get any pushback. It's a it's a good example of there are a lot of things that we can imagine in our minds. There's a famous psychological saying, don't believe everything that you think. And, you know, I wouldn't be teaching it if it didn't work. It's not like I'm sitting here, you know, 33 years into my professional financial advisor training career saying, eh, I think I'll teach people crap that doesn't work and just for my own entertainment value. Take us back to the meeting now. So I, I, we've, you know, welcomed them into the meeting, appreciate the effort you put forth into, you know, getting your financial house in order, you know, in order to, to be more effective as advisors and serve you well, want to let you know that we record the meetings. So what comes next? Like, where does this, where does the script take us next? Yeah. And let's, and let's just be clear. We're like 45 seconds into the meeting. Right, right, right. So that little opening takes 45 seconds. If you're, if you're, if you talk slower, it's 55 seconds. You know, if you talk faster, maybe it's 41 seconds and then you transition into the first conversation. So the first thing we're going to do, Michael and Ellie is get a perspective from each of you about what's important about money. Who wants to go first? And so, Michael, if I did that with you and Ellie, which of the two of you would volunteer to go first? Oh, that's going to end up being me. <laughs> you say it's going to be you or not be you? Uh, it will be me. Yes. Right. And so what I've learned, Michael, from experience doing this is to always work with a person who doesn't volunteer. So, Ellie, we're going to start with you today. What's important about money to you? Right. So now why did I do that? I asked who wants to go first. And you volunteered to go first. And I deliberately said, Michael and Ellie, I learned a long time ago to always work with the person who doesn't volunteer. So Ellie, we're going to start with you. What would be the reason for doing that? 
because otherwise I'm going to, you know, squash a bunch of Ellie's conversation and Ellie's going to feel a lot more elevated in your eyes because she feels more connected immediately because she's not, not getting pushed to second in the conversation. You're exactly correct. And you're, I think you're describing it because you know Ellie better than I do. I've never met Ellie. But what typically they're in most couples, there's a person who tends to be more dominant and a person who's less dominant. And sometimes it's it's really exaggerated. I mean, in some cases, you have somebody who is super extroverted and somebody who's super introverted. In some cases, it's relatively equal and it won't matter. But the tendency, and again, I think this is, well, I, I know from experience, this is a classic financial advisor communication mistake is focus. And I think this comes from too much sales training, focus on the person who wears the pants in the family. And the mistake is, to focus on the person who would be you know, more outgoing when oftentimes what happens, and I believe this should at least be an equal decision. I would actually argue that in, in couples, I think there should be three votes. I think he should have one and she should have two. And the reason is, is just statistically women outlive men by 10 or 15 years. And so if one of these people are to, were to you know, die or sort of when they're supposed to die or die prematurely, it's more often the man. So for most financial advisors, ultimately, you're going to have a relationship with one spouse or the other. And statistically, it's going to be her. And this could be why 70% of widows in the United States fire their financial advisor within 12 months of becoming widowed if they just don't have that relationship. Now, that being said, it could have been the other way around. Right. It could have easily just been Ellie who would have said, I'll go first. And Michael, who would have been happy to go second because he always goes second. Right. But either way, the goal is, is to start the conversation with the less dominant person, whether it's a dramatic difference or a small difference. I'm going to work with that person first. And so well, and I think there's an important I just point in framing to me around this. You know, I, you know, the discussion to me in the industry has been out there for a long time. Hey, you really need to engage both spouses and and you need to connect with them both and try not to focus all on one person or or the the we'll call it the, the dominant spouse, the dominant like spouse in the conversation, or wh- whichever, whichever person it happens to be. But I feel like there's a lot of uh, yes, we say that you're supposed to do that. Then I think a lot of the time, even even you know, planning to have a more balanced conversation with the best of intentions. Then the conversation begins and the dominant spouse does the dominant thing because that's usually why they're the dominant spouse in the conversation. And you know, the couple has figured this dynamic out a long time ago. So it's really hard to break their established rhythm that I, to me, just there's something very powerful for what you said in setting up that conversation of just saying, hey, you know, based on my years of experience, we actually find that it's often better to start the conversation with the person who doesn't volunteer first. So Ellie, tell me what's important about money to you, right? Just to me, that's an interesting, very clear example of, of, you know, this is what it means to lead a conversation, right? When you said earlier, you need to lead the conversation, don't control it, but you need to lead the conversation. That to me is just a really powerful, clear, concrete example. Like that's what we mean when we say lead the conversation. Yeah, that's really good. I appreciate the way you frame that, Michael, and you're correct. It is about, it's about leadership. It's not about control. It's about leadership because you're going to be their financial leader. Your job is to lead them to make smart choices about their money, to tell them what they need to do, not necessarily what they want to do so that they achieve their most important goals and fulfill their most deeply held values. You are their leader, right? You're not a salesperson of a product. You are their leader. That is what you're doing. And then we'll we'll get into in a moment, what do you do if the dominant person now interrupts the person? So I ask Ellie, what's important about money to you? And she's going to give me her answer. And then I'm going to build what's called her, her value staircase or values conversation. So this might take five or six or seven or eight minutes. And it's going to build. It typically starts, if we use Maslow's hierarchy as an example, it tends to start with what I call a level one values, security and freedom and having the lifestyle that we want to have. Level two values tend to be about others, taking care of my family, making a difference in the world, having an impact, the world being a better place, doing something in my community. Those are level two values. And level three values, which align with Maslow's self-actualization, if you want to use that as a framework, those are things like, I'm satisfied with my entire life. I feel fulfilled. I've achieved my purpose in life. I have a, a sense of peace. I have a nirvana. 
I mean, you'll hear those. And if you want sort of a typical value staircase, typical value staircase has between seven and 15 responses and they build that way. And so after I finish with Ellie, then I'm going to pivot and say, okay, Michael, now let's hear from you about what's important to you. What's important about money to you. Now, let me also say though, what if you as the more dominant person interrupt Ellie, either interrupt her, try to answer for her. This is another leadership moment. And again, I'm being just very professional. If I ask Ellie, what's important about money to you? Let's say that she needs to have 10 seconds to think about that before she answers. So first of all, am I comfortable with 10 second silences? And if I'm a good communicator, I am. I give her all the time that she needs to think of an answer. But what if you, her husband, have a six second silence threshold? She needs 10, you blow up at six. And so you try to answer for her. And I'm just going to very politely say, hey, Michael, I really appreciate that you probably have a good idea what's important to Ellie, and you probably could answer for her. But the way this exercise works is it's important for me and maybe even you to hear her answer for herself. So you'll get a turn in a moment. And in, in the meantime, I appreciate you just sitting there and relaxing and listening. Again, that's leadership, right? So this is, you're in, you're kind of in my world and this is my process. And again, I would go back to most financial advisors don't even have a scripted process. And then the second part of it, even after you have one, is you have to be good at facilitating that process. So we start going, let's say down the road of building the value staircase, I guess, up the staircase of building the value staircase, which I'm, I'm assuming is just kind of some successive questions and drilling deeper around the what's important about money to you discussion just to kind of get out these level one, level two, level three kinds of values. Yeah, it's actually even simpler than that. So again, through a massive amount of trial and error, listening to my own recordings, you know, and perfecting this 35 years ago when I was still a financial advisor. And then part of what I've done over the last 33 years is as I've trained financial advisors to follow this methodology and to record, depending on the level of training and coaching that they were involved in, I have listened to thousands of financial roadmap interviews and values conversations from various financial advisors. And so what I've learned from even before I started teaching it is the simplest way is to not change the question or change the question framework. So if I ask what's important about money to you, and someone says security, then I'll capture that and write the word security. And then the next question is, and what's important about security to you? So the framework question is always, what's important about the last answer to you? And some people will answer the question in a single word. Some people will use five or six words. Some people will use 30 seconds of words. And what happens as you get better and better at this is it's sort of like just seeing colors. You get good at hearing values. So not every word that they say is a values word, but the values words that they say stand out and you pluck those values words. And it doesn't have to be a single word. It could be one word or two or three words. So they might say, I want to make a difference in the community. So that whole statement, make a difference in the community, that's the values response that gets captured, written on their value staircase, and then they move up the value staircase one question at a time. And it typically takes, I think I mentioned earlier, it's anywhere from sort of seven or eight to 14 or 15. The fewest I've ever done is three. And the most values answers I've had is 17. But typically, let's call it seven to 15. And, and typically, it's a five to eight minute conversation. Because eventually, I just kind of do this, what's important about last answer to you? What's important about last answer to you? What's important about last answer to you? And we just sort of get to either something that is a natural conclusion, or we just clearly have gotten up to like level three self-actualization level values. And we sort of know like you, you really don't get any others beyond that. We're at the, we're at the top of the staircase. You get, you get to a point where people are sort of, ju it just gets to like pure feeling. And this is the emotional connection that I talked about. And again, I, I just thought it would be a good idea to help people explore their values and then define their goals so they'd make good decisions about financial planning. What happened 
And to my very pleasant surprise is how this conversation was going to completely disrupt their relationship with their existing advisor. In fact, in some cases, they would become pissed off at their advisor because in less than an hour, we have clarified and simplified and had conversations that they haven't had with their advisor who they had been doing business with before me for pay, maybe decades. So I was definitely looking for a way to help people make better decisions about planning. And I thought that would give me a competitive advantage. The very pleasant surprise was how much it disrupted their relationship. And I, I didn't feel like I was stealing them. I felt like I was rescuing them. So if you've got a relationship with a half financial advisor or planner, or even worse yet, just a stockbroker, money manager, insurance agent, and you want to do business with me instead, and I will do a much better job for you than they ever did, that's a good thing. Good for me. It's good for them. You know, that, that is a really good thing. But I can appreciate that. I know some of your listeners are you know, younger, newer advisors. You know, I was you know, also intimidated in the beginning thinking, why would some millionaire in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s basically fire their current financial advisor, who oftentimes are also friends? You know, their kids go to the same school together. They're both members of the La Jolla Country Club. They play bridge on Tuesdays. You know, can I really, you know, steal or rescue clients from those people? And, you know, as it turns out, you can, provided you actually have a better process and a better experience and ultimately are offering something to them that's better than what they have. So it, uh, if you have questions or comments about that, great, or I'm happy to continue to sort of put the pieces together of the values-based financial planning process. I think just can continue the, the process for us. So we're gathering just kind of the values conversation segment is just this what's important about money to you. What's important about that. What's important about that. What's important about that. So we, we, we climb up the the ladder a few times with the less dominant spouse. Then presumably we get to shift back to the original volunteer spouse, and and we get to go down the same conversation. So does that kind of wrap up that values conversation module, and then we move to to the goals conversation? Right, and so keep the timing in mind. So we the opening was less than a minute. Let's say each values conversation was seven or eight minutes. So now we're 16 or 17 minutes into the meeting and they've been doing all of the talking and they've been talking about things that are really important. And now the transition, there's always a transition. So you have the pieces, opening values, goals, all the money, commitment to hire. You have the pieces. Well, how do you transition between those between those pieces? So it's pretty simple. Well, now that we've had a chance to hear from each of you about what's important about money, the next logical step is to have a conversation about your tangible goals. So tell me about one of your goals that requires money and planning to achieve. They'll tell you. He might, and this is collaborative. So He'll say something, she'll say something. Sometimes uh, it, it's, it's worth, uh, sometimes it seems necessary to say, and this is a collaborative conversation. So tell me about a goal and they'll give you the name of the goal. And I, I think it's just worth saying here that just for clarification, I mean, I've been doing this for decades, thousands of times personally, thousands of recordings I've listened to from other financial advisors. Very few people actually say the word retirement. Right. And, and it just, it pains me to see. And, and I, th this happens so often that I started asking people, you know, I'm just curious. Again, this was just a practice thing. So to, after the fact, I, I started asking some of my clients and even some people who didn't become clients, you know, I noticed that you, you, you don't use the word retirement. They say they want to be financially independent. They want to pay for their lifestyle forever. They want to achieve financial security. And what I discovered is, especially financially successful people, they're very turned off by the term retirement. And I've asked even in groups, so, so what do you think about the word retirement? And they just get this look on their face like they just put their least favorite vegetable in their mouth and they want to spit it out. And I just say, well, what are, the, what are the words that come up for you? And the words are death, lack of purpose, uselessness, and they're just all these negative words. And I find it enormously entertaining how many financial professionals say, I'm a retirement specialist without really any consideration to the fact that by stating that publicly, you may be turning off the very people that you really want to work with. And I, I have noticed that the more 
financially successful people are, the entrepreneurs, the business owners, the people who actually like their work. You know, Michael, you like to work, don't you? Yeah, I can't possibly imagine retirements. Like that sounds horribly boring and <laughs> would probably drive my spouse nuts because I don't have any other productive things to do. I mean, it's just so you think about that and well, why would you want to introduce a word that would create a negative emotional reaction? So I just want to say, you're asking them, tell me about a goal that requires money and planning to achieve. You're not suggesting. So when you're listening to your recordings, one of the things that you'll notice is, did you really ask questions or did you turn questions into statements? So what you would not do is say something like, well, if you're like a lot of financially successful people in this area, you probably want to make sure that you're prepared for retirement. That's not a question. That's a statement. So the question or, or is, my question is, so tell me when you would like to retire so that we can help you plan for that. Right. You can still ask a question and make it wrong. <laughs> so you're not planting goals or telling people what their goals should be. You're asking an open-ended question. Tell me about a goal that requires money and planning to achieve. And your your goal when you are putting you're putting their words on their financial roadmap. Right? Every you don't write every word they say, but every word you write is a word that actually came out of their mouth. This is so this is just good communication skills. So whether you would ever use our financial roadmap or not, hopefully what's what you're getting here as you're listening is this is how great communicators communicate. They don't presume anything, they don't project anything, right? So but if you're trying to sell something that you've predetermined to sell, then you might, well, I gotta I they gotta want to retire because my whole thing is our products that line up with retirement. And so think about who the ideal clients are. Right? Would you rather have clients who love to work? Well, who do you think has more money? People like Michael Kitsis, who loves to work and is good at it, or people who go to work every day who can't wait to retire? Right. The ones that the ones that do it with motivation and purpose often end out driving a lot more career results and end out being more favorable clients for us as financial advisors in the first place. So our 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 self-selection bias is there may be lots of people who actually really do want to retire and can't wait to get out of their jobs. It's just least likely to be the people that we actually tend to work with. Yeah, they, pro they probably, again, it's not an exact science, but they probably have less money. It's just common sense that people who love their work and love to work. I just read an article about Elon Musk. And before I say this about Elon Musk, I'm not talking about elephant hunting here. Right. So most of us want to work with people who have between a million and 20 million. That's just the high net worth, not the ultra high net worth because they're paying, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year. And since we can only have a finite number of clients, then every client has to generate enough money. So we don't end up like most financial advisors working too many hours for too little money for too many of the wrong clients. So circling, circling back, I ask the question. And then for every goal, there's the name of the goal, their name of the goal, whatever they call it. Now, if they say retirement, fine, it's their word. But don't be surprised when you don't hear retirement very much. Instead, you hear, we'd like to be financially independent. We'd like to make sure that we have enough money to pay for our lifestyle forever, the lifetime financial security, financial freedom. I often hear, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abbreviate, but don't be surprised when you hear F you money. And they often won't say F you, they'll actually say the whole thing. And that's, I mean, if that's what they say, it's their financial roadmap, right? So you put their words on their financial roadmap. So you get the name of the goal and you do one goal at a time. So you get the name of the goal. And then the second thing is the target date. So by when would you like to have enough money to know that you're financially independent for life? And they'll typically give you an like, well, by the time I'm such and such an age, or they might already be there. Well, we think we're there now. And so you might write now. If it's a target date, if they give you an age, then it's what year will that be? And you end up with an actual month, day, and year because that makes the goal much more compelling. It's much more compelling if somebody says by you know May 1st of 2037 than if they say by the time I'm 60. May 1st, 2037 is much more emotionally compelling and again, remember, I'm contrasting. I'm not saying I'm better than their current financial advisor. 
I'm just being better than their current financial advisor. And their current financial advisor probably doesn't have it down to a month, day, and year. Any questions or comments about that? Am I also drilling towards a a, a goal amount, right? The proverbial like have a million dollars to retire at age whatever, or sustain X dollars a month or a year of lifestyle or, you know, whatever is, is it just get a boat by the time I'm 60 or is it like get a $50,000 boat by the time I'm 60? Like how, how much do we tie to the dollars versus just, just the conceptual goal in the year? So there are four, four elements. And the first is a, an amount, uh, the goal's name, the target date. And the third thing is now let's say that we're talking about the goal I've used to illustrate, and we can talk about other goals like a boat or sending kids to college or buying a vacation home or structuring, you know, funding a foundation. There are lots of goals. So just keeping consistent with the one that's on the table right now. So you want to be, have lifetime financial independence by this day, how much net spendable money per month or per year would you like to have? Now, there's a reason why I asked it that way. And you, in anticipating this, Michael, you did a really good job. Some people say, well, we'd like to accumulate a million dollars or $5 million or $10 million. Well, that's them trying to do your job, right? So their job is to tell you what the outcome is. We'd like to have $200,000 a year of net spendable for our lifestyle. And it's your job to figure out how much money they have to accumulate in order to be able to do that for whatever their projected lifetime is. And so if they say that, if they say, well, we'd like to have a million dollars. So technically they didn't answer your question. So you've got to make sure your question is asked in the way that if they answer the question you ask, it'll work. But sometimes you ask the question correctly and they interpret it to be something else. So if I ask you how much net spendable money per month or per year would you like to have? And they say, well, I think we need to have $5 million. I would just say, you know, Michael, that that might be true. And when we do the financial planning, we'll do that calculation to figure it out. The question I'm asking, though, is how much net spendable money? What are you actually spending on your lifestyle? And then we'll hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about this a, a little bit. But it's, you know, there's a what I'm really talking about here is being a great, like a at least the top 10% or a player financial professional. I'm not, we're talking about you're really good at what you do. You harness your tools. I think one of the questions that could come up is, gee, how do you get this much confidence? You know, Part of it is, yes, you have a really good process that you take people through that naturally disrupts their current relationship and makes them want to hire you. And after they hire you, they are genuinely getting much better outcomes, much better results, a much better process. I call it a client value promise. Not a big fan of the term proposition. So now I've got three things. I got the name of the goal, the target date, the amount of money, and now I'm going to make it emotionally compelling. And the way that I do that is I look at both of you, even if you've answered most of the questions about that, and sometimes one spouse or another has more data about a particular goal. Sometimes one spouse or another has a goal that the other spouse doesn't give a crap about. And there's an interesting sort of dynamic that you discover there. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And now I just asked the question. So Michael and Ellie, so it's now May 1st of 2037, and you are totally confident that you have achieved lifetime financial independence and that you can have $200,000 a year. Notice I don't say stupid things like in today's dollars. I mean, that's just financial advisor jargon, right? So you have $200,000 a year to pay for your lifestyle. What are two or three words that describe what you're thinking and feeling now that you've achieved that goal? And I'm going to get words from you and words from Ellie. And I'm going to write those on the financial roadmap. They're actually these little, they're called goal shields because the financial roadmap is, is built like a map. And so you've got values and then along the road toward the fulfillment of your values, you're achieving your goal. So it's, it's laid out in a way that is psychologically, visually compelling. And then we're going to go on to the next goal, the name of the goal, the target date, the amount of money, words that describe what they're thinking and feeling. And now I'm like 30 minutes into the meeting because each goal takes about three to five minutes. Most people have three or four goals. I'm 30 minutes into the meeting and now they have this compelling vision of their future. Wow, that's what's important to us. Those are their goals. The people they're currently doing business with haven't done it, at least done it this well. It's not this clear. And then what's missing? 
the money, the resources. Like, how do we make that happen? Bill, that sounds awesome. How do we make that happen? We're going to take a look at that. Call it the all the money exercise. And now we're going to benchmark where they are now. And then it becomes very obvious. Oh, we need a plan or we need a better plan. And of course, how do I know that there isn't a physical plan? Because they brought all their financial documents in and had there been a plan, it's one of the things I asked them to bring in. And so I see the tax returns and I see the insurance policies and I see the brokerage statements and I see the uh, mutual fund statements and I see the annuities and I see the legal documents and I, I see all these financial documents and there's no plan. So it's not really complicated. So we're now at the end, if I want to invite them to become a client, they're now looking at a big piece of paper in front of them. This is where you are now. These are your tangible goals. And this is what's important to you. And honestly, Michael, this came right out of professional development. This is strategic planning. The values are your vision. The goals are the tangible what, and you benchmark where you are now. And this is pretty much how every serious individual in every business does planning. Hey, this is our vision. This is what we want to accomplish and by when, and here's our current position. Now we're going to create a game plan to get from where we are now to where we want to be. So we achieve our goals for the reasons that are important to us. I mean, this is the way I talked earlier about the merging of professional development and financial planning. I just make it really simple. And then I just look at them and I say, well, now that you're looking at your financial roadmap for living your life on purpose, what's been the benefit of the exercise that we've gone through in the last 30 minutes or so that we've been together? And then you tell me what you thought was good about it, what the benefit was. Ellie tells me what she thought the benefit was. The risk that I take is that you both look at it, me and go, this was a waste of 30 minutes, right? Well, if you think it was a waste of 30 minutes, what do you think the chances are that I'm going to invite you to become a client? Right. Good, good, good way to screen out the process. If you really were not in any way, shape or form into that conversation, like let's just save ourselves the trouble right here. Remember, we're building an ideal client community. So we're either looking for profitable, non-ideal clients as what I call bridge financing. The ultimate goal is to have a finite number of ideal clients, no more than 50, because if you do the time arithmetic, and I know you had wrote a, you actually wrote a really good blog post about this, and I'm in total agreement. If you really do the time arithmetic, you can't actually be a great financial professional, a financial advisor for more than about 50 people, because it takes a lot of time to really help people achieve their goals and fulfill their values and keep them on track and hold them accountable. So then the question becomes, well, how much do each of these people have to pay? in order for 50 times that number to be enough money for you as the financial advisor to achieve your goals and fulfill your values and hopefully create your ideal life. And so I get that question a lot. Well, Bill, what if people don't like the process? Well, your ideal clients like the process, right? I mean, that's sort of the definition. You don't have like seven processes trying to appeal to seven different personality types. Your ideal clients like the process. I remember when I was in my late twenties, I was dating a girl and her name was Annette. You know, Michael, I'm, you know, you're such a suave guy. You might've never had this happen, but I got, I got dumped pretty unceremoniously by Annette. And one of my good friends, Joe, he looked at me and said, Hey, it's Friday night, man. Let's go out. Let's go have a few beers and go to a club. And I said, you know, I'm just not in the mood. He goes, are you still moping about being dumped by Annette? And I said, well, I don't know if I call it moping, but I'm not happy about it. I'm not really excited about going out and partying. And he looked at me and he, and he looked at me like, what's wrong with you? And, and I, and I, and I said, well, you know, I, I thought she might've been the one. <laughs> and he looked at me and he laughed right in my face. And he said, oh yeah, she was the one. I mean, other than the fact that she doesn't want to have anything to do with you, she's perfect. So we, we get too wrapped up in the people that we're chasing instead of just saying like, you know what, probably wasn't a fit. Let's, let's go find someone else who is. We're trying to convince people to hire us. Again, that sort of comes back to, that's like a sales tactic. People don't plan to fail. We're trying to sell planning. And I would agree, everybody would be better off with planning. I don't think there's any argument there, but not everybody can afford somebody as you know good as, I'm going to say you, I'm going to project that everybody listening to have us have us this conversation, everybody listening to us have this conversation. It's a great financial advisor. Right. Well, one of the ways we know you're great is how much people are willing to pay you. Right. This is, you know, we're in, we're all in Western cultures. That's one of the metrics. You know, chances are if you're cheap, you're probably not great. And part of the problem is if you're cheap, you have to have too many clients to actually be great for all those clients. So 
you, if you're really that good, you've got to be paid enough to make this work. So just because people need planning just doesn't mean they can afford planning. That's one of the reasons why I was fortunate enough to co-found the Foundation for Financial Planning. So yeah, I believe everybody should have access to planning, but as a smart business person, you want to work with people who can pay you enough so that the metrics work. So while you're helping them achieve their goals, you're also making enough money to achieve your goals and fulfill your values. Explain to us this financial roadmap document deliverable thing, whatever it is. Like you've referred to it many times as we're creating and filling out. So I'm presuming this is like, this is literally a, a a physical document, a deliverable. Is this like a you know a template you build? Is this a thing you're literally filling out or like handwriting out in the meeting? Talk to us a little bit more about what the financial roadmap is. Uh, yeah, it, it is what you described. It is a physical document. It's big. It's seventeen by twenty two inches, which is when you fold it into quarters, that's an eight and a half by 11. You unfold it at 17 by 22 inches. And just visually in the, in the upper right hand section, those are the value staircases. And then below the value staircases are the goals. And in the bottom left quadrant, that's a little summary of their current financial situation. How much cash reserves do they have? How much debt do they have? You can't really list all their insurance. You do that on the back of the financial roadmap. And then there's a number for the current amount of money that they have to fund their goals. So all of their money may not be available to fund their goals. So it's the, it's the goal funding money that they currently have. And so it's really simple. It's really clean. It puts it into perspective. And yeah, particularly for the generation that you want to do business with, Right. So we're talking about people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, because that's who has all the money. So this is much more effective when it's more analog. So a lot of people they say, well, hey, we want to put everything on the big, on the big screen. And I do think for the implementation meeting, you know, when you are actually opening up your planning software, which is after you've been hired. So the financial roadmap gets you hired to do planning. So the mistake a lot of advisors make is they think, well, I'll open up my software and I'll show you how cool planning is and then you'll want to buy it, right? So our approach is you actually get hired and paid and then you start doing planning. You don't do technical work until after you've been hired and paid. You actually don't answer any technical questions till after you've been hired and paid. That may be a whole nother conversation that we have, but just to answer your question, it, it's more compelling if it's if it's analog. Because if you open up a big screen and you have a big television in your room, now that becomes the focal point. So when you turn, everybody's turned and they're looking at the big screen as opposed to either sitting next to each other or across from each other. And then of course, it's more emotionally compelling to see it written in your handwriting, which anybody can have legible handwriting if they choose to, versus some computer generated text. So computer so, generated text is less personal. I'm writing this out as the advisor or the or my clients are writing this out as they go. You're essentially the scribe. So they're thinking and and communicating and it's another way that you demonstrate that you're listening. So one of the challenges I've done this for a lot of years is remember I'm listening to some of the advisors in our higher level training and coaching programs. They're sending in recordings. I actually coached one yesterday and I'm listening to the recording and I'm looking at a picture of the financial roadmap that was submitted with the recording. And one of the things I'm paying attention to is what's written on the financial roadmap. Does that match the words that came out of the prospect's mouths? And oftentimes it doesn't. So we're not paraphrasing. If somebody says financial independence, again, the worst thing you could say is, oh, so you want to have enough money to retire. They didn't say retire. They didn't, they said financial independence. So you write what they said, right? So if they say security, you don't write safety. I mean, it's literally every word on their financial roadmap came out of their mouth. So they, they not only know that you're listening by how you're communicating, but they can see that you're listening because the words on their financial roadmap match the words they actually said. 
So it's much more, uh, it's much more compelling. And it also speaks to the idea and I get it. I mean, I was a 26 year old kid when I entered this business and I wanted to work with people who were millionaires and it's a life stage thing. It's not so much a generational thing, but it takes decades for most people to become millionaires, right? So most largest group, when mo- most people become millionaires, if they ever become millionaires in their sixties, right? So fifties on the young side, seventies on the old side, most in their sixties. So there are exceptions to that, but for the most part, that's when you become millionaires. So I had to learn how to, there's a saying, it's like talk the way they buy. So you have to be like them. And I think the mistake that most of us make, and it's a natural mistake is we want people to buy the way we would buy. And so that's why everybody wants to use all their technology. So I want to put this on a big screen and I want to type things in on the screen because that seems cooler. Well, that's not how people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s view it. So when you look overall at this process that you've created, I I know you've trained many thousands of advisors in over over the years. I mean, I guess I'm just wondering as you look back on this, like what, what what would most advisors not understand or not get about growing an advisory business? Yeah, that's, I think it's a couple of things. It's some, a lot of it we've talked about today. I think it's, it's believing that, boy, if I just become a great enough technician, that will be the key to being a successful advisor. And, and I think that, I think as we know, you know, again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I mean, you want to be a great technician and I can, tell you a story about what I did to compensate for my lack of being a great technician. But I think it's it's underappreciating the value of what, and I, and I bristle when I say this because I don't like them being called the soft skills, right? Because they're, they're really the soft skills that produce the big results. Being a great communicator, understanding that trust is not a function of your technical ability. Trust is much more a function of your, your character, your ability to ask good questions and listen, uh, holding people accountable to the advice. There are these soft skills, really appreciating the value of being a great communicator, being able to facilitate people through a powerful process, being able to create a, you know, an experience. It's, people make their decisions experientially, not by you speaking some words to try and convince people. And so uh, that was something I was fortunate to recognize very, very quickly. So Merrill Lynch is going to fire me if I don't bring in business. They're not going to fire me because I I didn't become X better technician. And so that's why I became fixated on mastering the communication skills side of this. And actually, I find it, found it comparatively easy to do the technical work. And I think it's even easier in this day and age to get the technical work done. We could talk about that if you want, but that's probably the, the biggest thing. And I think the other thing would just be the work ethic. You know, you've got this. So we were talking about it as part of our sort of conversation before we rolled the recording. And you've got that great visual about the iceberg, right? And that we tend to see only what's above the surface, but what's below the surface is much bigger. And uh, I love your philosophy about that. And I think you're right on with that. And I think most people just don't appreciate just how much work is involved, you know, how much pain might be involved, you know? So are the best advisors really recording their meetings and listening to those recordings? I mean, how much time does that take? You know, how much pain is that? And, you know, the answer to that question is, yeah, you know, they are but you may not, you, you don't see everything that they actually do. So I think there's an underestimation of the most important skills and an underestimation of just how much, not just amount of work is involved, but how much maybe painful work is involved to actually be successful. So what was the low point for you on the journey of building and learning and teaching all of this? You're, you're talking about uh, learning it when I was an advisor or like teaching it now? Just whatever whatever stands out over the past 30 odd years that you've been on, on this journey. Yeah, I think the low point for me, both as a financial advisor and training is, and I hate to sound cynical about this because I'm actually a very optimistic person. It's sort of a catch-22, but the low point is I'm just so disappointed at how average people are willing to be just how easily they accept being an average financial professional 
doing average work for their clients, you know, making an average amount of money to have an average lifestyle. You know, and I guess that's just my overachiever and achiever nature. But again, we talk about putting the client first. It's just stunning to me how great some of the tools are and how many advisors make no attempt to really master the tools that they have. And I'll start with the financial planning software. So if you take eMoney, Money Guide Pro, I think it's just called Money Guide now, you know, Right Capital, Navaplan, Buoyant, going all the way back to financial profiles and some of the early planning software, those tools are so robust. There's so much that they will do. And yet most financial advisors, I don't think they're even aware of all the features and benefits of the tool that first of all, would be great for the clients. So when you're not really accessing all those tools, you are you know, failing to do what is your prime directive of being a financial advisor, a little Star Trek term for you. Your prime directive is to put the client first. And when you choose to not harness 100% of the features and benefits of your tools, you're basically putting the client second, especially if it's your own comfort. And I hear that all the time from veteran advisors in particular, what kind of planning tools do you use? Well, I created this little Excel spreadsheet and you just kind of go and, and how is that the best thing that's available in 2021 to serve your clients? Well, you know, I mean, it's what I'm familiar with. It's what I like. So I like my spreadsheet better than e-money. Well, but if e-money is actually better for your clients, don't you have an obligation to deploy that? Well, I don't really want to do that at this point in my career. And, and that was, and, but it's a combination thing. So I remember when I was a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch and I discovered financial planning, we had a financial planning department. You could outsource the money management to pros. And yet, frankly, most of these morons just said, well, I'm just a stockbroker. I'm just going to sell stocks and bonds. And there were all these things that would be valuable for their clients. And the catch 22 was, and the light bulb for me was, oh, well, if all these stockbroker morons at Merrill Lynch are operating this way, then I'll bet they're doing the same thing at Morgan Stanley and Dean Witter and EF Hutton and Shearson. And those are the clients I'm going to steal because how easy will it be to disrupt a relationship with somebody who's been working with basically a stockbroker? And that's how I see most financial advisors today. They're just wealth managers. The only difference is they just gather assets, put it on a platform and collect 1%. And really, even if they say they do planning, they don't really do what we would call planning. So on the one hand, it's enormously disappointing. And I think it's uh, bad for the clients and bad for the advisors in the business. On the other hand, you might, hopefully you as the listener are sitting there going, fantastic, because there's still a lot of opportunity for me to st- Deal or rescue those clients from those people. So, I, and I've just made peace with that, Michael. I've just made peace with the fact that I had hoped that I would transform the whole industry from salespeople to trusted advisors. But I don't have to tell you, the salesperson financial advisor is still alive and well. Yeah, I, I think the distinction, though, is the trusted advisor, as I call it, the the financial advisor. You know, the advisors are growing. I mean, that's the segment of the industry that's growing. Right now, and 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 all the rest are are collectively shrinking and struggling for you know a wide range of competitive reasons. From advisors taking their business on one end and more automated tools taking the business from the other end. Because if you're really solely in the product sales business, at at some point, anybody who actually wants the product will just be able to get it with a couple of clicks of a mouse button. Not holistic advice and not expo- you know powerful conversations that we're talking about here. But like, if you need a financial product. Like the internet's going to increasingly serve that up to you. So I, I as I view it, I, I think the, I think the transformation's happening. It's just, you know, in in an industry where good advisors have like ninety seven or ninety eight percent retention rates, and bad advisors have ninety two percent retention rates, it takes an astonishingly long time. I think frustrating for a lot of us, but like it takes an astonishingly long time for clients to actually shift from not very good advisors or people who aren't even really in the advising business, but put it on their business card to the financial advisors. But it is happening. Yeah. I'm, I'm, remember, I'm like an achiever, overachiever type. So nothing happens quickly enough for me. But also keep in mind, I mean, I, I started this. This is why I left being a successful financial advisor. You know, A career that I loved was to create more leverage. So for me, it was a values decision. Well, if I keep doing what I'm doing, 
I'm only going to have, you know, 50 people who are going to get the benefit of what I do. And it was actually one of my mentors who challenged me and said, so Bill, if you took this methodology that you've created, he said, I don't think you realize what you have here. I mean, you're just sharing with a couple of friends and it's working for them too. You know, what if you took this out to the whole industry, you know, set up a training company? I was 29 years old. I mean, I, I did, I, it was a big risk, although he helped me understand, well, you're not married, you don't have kids, you know, you can always come back in if it doesn't work and, and be a successful advisor again, you know, but I guess I thought 33 years would be enough because it was starting to happen then. So I, I hope you're right. I think it may be a bell curve thing. I think it may just be that the reality is, is no matter what you do, if an advisor is an A player, just like there'll probably always be A students, B students, and C students, there may always be people who just choose to be average, and it may just be the, the global human condition. And there will always be an opportunity for the cream to rise to the top. And, but I, I would, what I think needs to happen is there really just needs to be some kind of serious standard in the industry. I mean, the government standard is just low, and the company standards are equally as low. Imagine what would happen if everybody who was putting themselves out there as a financial advisor or financial planner, I mean, what if there was just had to be some evidence that you've actually done for yourself what you're proposing to do for clients? I mean, you don't even, I mean, it's stunning how many people in this business who hold themselves out as planners don't have a plan and or aren't making enough money to fund the plan if they had one. So how does someone who isn't on track to achieve their own goals going to help somebody else achieve their goals? It's, it's sort of a catch-22 irony. I'm not saying you have to be rich to give advice to rich people, but you don't have to be rich to have a plan. You don't have to be rich to have cash reserves. You don't have to be rich to live within your means. You don't have to be rich to be adequately insured. You don't have to be rich to be, you know, have a reasonable debt to income ratio and a good credit score. Right? But there's no requirement in this business that anybody actually do what it is that they are, and I hate to use the word selling, there's just no requirement. That stuns me as well. I mean, but again, it's the opportunity for those people like you, and I know your followers who are choosing to be great. You know, the opportunity is since most financial advisors are not choosing to be great, how hard could it be to take their clients? And I get that question a lot, Billy, Bob, Billy, you're awfully cavalier about stealing other people's clients. It's like, well, yeah, because I know the truth about what the quality is out there of what most financial advisors are doing. So how hard could it be? So what advice would you give to you know, newer advisors coming into the industry today who, you know, who do want to choose to be great, as you put it, but you know, are starting from square one <laughs> industry as it exists today? Like, what, what advice would you give to the newer advisor that, that wants to become one of the great financial advisors going forward? Yeah, I love these people. I mean, these are my people. So I know, you know, it's been a long time since I was a 26 year old rookie, but it just feels like yesterday to me. You know, it just, it's, yeah, I don't know why. There are some things in my life I don't remember well, but I just have this affinity for people who are newer to the business. And it sort of breaks my heart when they get stuck listening to some limiting belief that's hoisted on them by some well-meaning, you know, executive or manager or, you know, even a teacher or trainer. So a few things come to mind. The first is to be more confident about moving up market to work with people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and older. First of all, they have all the money, right? These are the millionaires who can pay 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a year and up for real financial planning and services and advice. And don't believe that clients who've worked with their current advisor for decades are loyal to that advisor. They can be stolen, or as I like to say, rescued from their current advisor. Most financial advisors, even financially successful veterans, are shockingly average when it comes to what they actually do for their clients. They simply aren't nearly as good as they would like you to believe they are. I mean, everybody wants to believe that their clients are totally satisfied and loyal, but the truth is that most financial advisors haven't been fired only because a better financial advisor just hasn't come along, right? So their clients would move to the other financial advisor. They just haven't met them. So if they did meet that better advisor, they would leave. And your job is to be that better advisor, better communicator, better process, better experience, better client value promise. 
and be very careful. I mentioned this earlier about well-meaning advisors and corporate trainers and other teachers even passing along their fears and limiting beliefs to you. Like my sales manager who told me when I was 26 years old that I'd have to start by working in my natural market. I mean, worst advice ever. If I had listened to that BS, I never would have created values-based financial planning. And I certainly would not be your guest today on this podcast. So many of the advisor, uh, the members of our advisor roadmap virtual training platform are children of financial advisors. And totally unintentionally, their mother or their father, they're often passing along beliefs about the business that may or may not have been true in the 80s when these people started, but definitely are not true today and may have never been the truth. So I'm not saying they're lying, but just because they believe that to be true does not mean it's, it's actually true. The other thing that comes to mind is don't make the mistake of working with small clients like they're somehow the practice clients right? And that's kind of awful if you think about it. Yeah, I'm going to work with these little clients because you know their money is just as important to them, maybe more important as the clients you'd ultimately like to work with. And if you work with too many small clients, well, that's how you end up working too many hours for too little money for too many of the wrong clients. And once you get stuck in that quagmire of working too many hours for too little money for too many of the wrong clients, it's really hard to break out of. It's not easier to get people with less money to hire you. It's exactly the same exercise. So you might as well focus on working with people that you want to work with. And and I think I might have already said this, but I'm just going to double down on communication skills are your most valuable asset. Your ability to ask the right questions at the right time, to listen with empathy and make a strong emotional connection with both spouses or life partners, and to be able to articulate your advice with conviction in a way that motivates people to actually take action like hiring you in the first place and then following your advice to implement. I mean, this skill is your most valuable asset. It's always been an advisor's most valuable asset. And especially as we move faster and faster into a world of AI, where machines are progressively doing more and more of the technical work, the last thing the machines will be able to possess are incredible people skills and communication skills. I mean, by definition, a machine can't make a human connection. And I guess the last thing that comes to mind, I think it's the last thing, is to outsource as much of the technical work as you possibly can. Outsource it to other human subject matter experts and maximize the use of technology, like the full capability of your planning software. This is much better for your clients than you trying to be the smartest person in the room. You should definitely have a high financial IQ, but there really isn't a need for you to be able to answer every technical question about asset allocation, interest rates, insurance policies, Medicare, Social Security, retirement plans. So you can outsource a lot of that because you're the expert at acquiring ideal clients and holding those people accountable to execute or implement the advice. So that's I'm really passionate about that. I'm also equally, I mean, I challenge my peers, those advisors over 50. I think the average financial advisor is 57 or 58. I'm very happy to challenge them, you know, either get yourself up to speed or, you know, get out of the business. You know, your clients deserve somebody who's really staying current. I call the most old financial advisors the coasting generation. You know, they put a bunch of assets under management. They do light financial planning. So I encourage the next generation of financial advisors to advisors to steal or rescue clients from the coasting generation. So what are you working on now? What what comes next for you? I'm having fun. I'm mostly living my ideal life. So I think I'm a reasonably good example of that. The Advisor Roadmap Virtual Training Platform is essentially my legacy. It's really the culmination of 33 years of training financial professionals to be totally trusted advisors or yours in your vernacular, really true financial advisors. And we put everything we know about client acquisition, client service, leadership, time management, and more, we put that all on a virtual training platform. So virtually every financial professional in the world would have access to what they need to do to build an ideal business with ideal clients and create their ideal life. And, you know, I went, you know, five years ago, you know, our program was $5,000 a month on a four-year contract. So I was training a smaller number of advisors for a large amount of money each. And now I flipped that whole thing. So now it's a membership site like Netflix for financial advisors, success training for such a small amount of money that I really want price to not be an obstacle 
for any advisor who's serious about success. And so for advisors who are interested, like just what what is the what is the cost to go through the program? Well, they actually get a discount because you have a because we have a relationship with you. So go to youradvisorroadmap.com and that will take you to the information site about our membership site called Your Advisor Roadmap. It's literally a roadmap of exactly what to do to meet high net worth people, to set appointments with high net worth people. So they come with both spouses and all their documents. I mean, it's literally a roadmap, step-by-step, step, all the scripts. And you have a couple of options when you get there. So at the top right-hand corner, if you're not ready to invest any money, then just sign up for our free online training. We do an online training every month called Mastering Client Acquisition, and you can sign up for that. Or you can get a very thorough explanation about our virtual training platform, and it's $1,800 for the year. So in money shouldn't be an issue. For the fraction of the value of even an average client, it's $1,800 for an annual subscription, renewable at that rate. One client, not, not even one client. One, one client will probably cover a few years for it. Yeah, cer certainly not an ideal client, but again, I understand that you know advisors. Some of them got to walk before they run, and maybe some of my numbers scared you off. I hope they don't. Uh, ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars per client per year. I mean, that's that's where you should be living. And then Kitsies, all you have to do is put Michael your last name K I T C E S. It's not case sensitive. That's a promo code, and so your. Anybody who knows that, frankly, because we don't have any way of saying, oh, are they really a follower of Michael Kitsies? Did they listen to this podcast? So if they knew that, just put in Kitsies and that'll knock 20% off. It's then $1,440. Oh, I appreciate the discount for our listeners. Uh, for anyone who's following along and, and maybe can scribble all that down, this is episode 241. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 241, we'll have links out to uh, Advisors Roadmap so you can find your way over there if you want to check it out. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is just the, the word success means very different things to different people. And so as someone who's you know, built an incredibly successful platform, and I, I know there was a, a point where you were charging you know, like a, a quarter of a million dollars in coaching for a single advisor over a four-year period. And you know, now you're living the, the virtual online advisor roadmap to, to reach the massive advisors. So the business has done well. How do you define success for yourself at this point? Well, I define it, and, and I would say I think we all should define success in this way, but it's different for everybody. So it's, it's what is your vision for your ideal life? I mean, that's the first course inside the advisor roadmap is creating a vision for your ideal life. And there are six ideal life questions. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What are you doing? Who are you with? And who are you being? Right. So I have my view of my ideal life. And then the goal is to put your business to align with your vision of your ideal life. You know, for me, I still love helping people and making a difference. And so my, I mean, it's why if I had stayed as a financial advisor, I mean, I, I made plenty of money. Actually, my mentor who told me that, he said, Bill, I think you're going to be fine financially. The question is, how will you make the biggest impact? And so maybe I would have actually made more money if I'd stayed as a financial advisor, but he was right. I have plenty of money to live my ideal life. And so health and fitness is a high priority for me. So in fact, I have expert interviews inside our virtual training platform, and I'm fascinated with uh, AI and the positive impact it's going to have on the world. I'm a big student of the singularity. So I'm actually on the adjunct faculty of Singularity University. And uh, if you don't know the singularity, I would suggest you just Google the word the singularity and learn more about that. And there are interesting implications for the financial services industry, but more important for health and longevity. And so I'm fascinated with that. I have a relationship with a business called Human Longevity Inc. Uh, so I'm primarily a client, but I also send a lot of my friends and clients and people to that. If you looked up Human Longevity Inc. and they have a service called Health Nucleus, uh, it's, also, it's also referred to as 100 plus. And I think one of the things uh, we don't consider both as humans and as financial advisors is, boy, how long are we actually going to live? And there is some, I mean, there is legitimate science and technology that could extend the, our, our lives, but more importantly, the quality of our lives by many more decades than an actuarial table of an insurance company. Boy, what if that's true? 
right? So, hey, how much money do you need if you live to be 120 when you thought you were going to die at 90? And so this is, I, I, that's how I keep myself mentally stimulated. You know, I exercise 12 to 15 hours a week, you know, not including massage and physical therapy. So health and fitness is a high priority and helping people. I'm on a couple of boards. Uh, so that's, that's what I do with a lot of my time. So it's still aligned with my values and it is evolving. Well, very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Well, Michael, you're, you're welcome. And they're not just sort of platitudes. I don't accept uh, every, just any invitation. So again, I just want to acknowledge you and the work that you're doing, the followers that you have, all the interesting businesses that you have, like Advice Pay, helping financial advisors be more effective. Really, congratulations on the great work that, that you're doing and continue to do. I really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think we're, we're kindred spirits on the from products to advice from you know, salespeople to advisors mission. So really appreciate you joining us and sharing the journey. My pleasure. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the member section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.